For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Paulus. Um, I used to live in London until the 1st of December of last year, um, which is partly why I decided to kind of host this or do this talk in English. So I hope, I hope this is all right for you guys. Um, my theme is ink. And considering that I'm a typographer is a very appropriate theme, I would say. The nature of ink, the actual idea of ink, allows me to put my ideas onto paper. But it does more than that. It is also a symbol for what any kind of designer, any creative person um, produces and puts down onto paper or into, into a product, whether um, these products are of typographic nature, of musical nature, um, even, even ink or color used originally in, in the Lascaux cave paintings, etc., allowed us to create a sort of critical distance to what we are actually doing as designers. Um, and this already brings me to the structure of this talk. I will try to dive in and out of theory, and I will attempt to connect it to practice. So although it's 9.15 on a Friday morning, and we're all probably hoping for the weekend to start very soon. Please bear with me for a few minutes in order to attempt to do this sort of stunt. I think this stunt is fairly appropriately placed here at the AIL, because according to what um, our principal just said, I call him our principal, because I'm teaching at the Angewandte, um, it is a place where you, you can explore ideas. And this is pretty much what I will try to do with this talk as well. So I will call this, or I call this lecture, Ink, Intuition and Consciousness. Ideally, I was, ideally ink would be spelled with a C, then I could have made a funny typographic joke, but it is not. This doesn't matter at all, because intuition and consciousness are two things that are very closely related to anything that we are putting onto paper. Um, putting onto paper as in what we are creating, because it doesn't necessarily, I repeat myself, have to be on paper. How does one start to practice? How does one start to gain knowledge? How does one start to produce theory? For me, theory are principles that are being abstracted from practice, i.e., I practice and then I think what I have done there. And these principles that I abstract from my practice, I use further on in my work. But how does this practice start? I refer here to uh, John Bardessari with a, with a fantastic piece of art. Um, I'm going to read this briefly. I had this old pencil on the dashboard of my car for a long time. Every time I saw it, I felt uncomfortable since its point was so dull and dirty. I always intended to sharpen it and finally couldn't bear it any longer and did sharpen it. I'm not sure, but I think that this has something to do with art. I feel exactly the same way. I'm not sure of what I do but I feel there is something in there that I want to explore, that I want to investigate. And my investigation today is with regards to how we read, what we read, how communication happens. And in theory, or very often, we think that reading happens um, with the, or sorry, that uh, communication happens when we create something, but it doesn't. It only starts when the reader makes sense of it. So communication really, and reading really happens um, when the person picks something up that we have done. We read concepts, not words. This is uh, the shape sort of my now almost three-year-old son. And um, he looks at an object and he makes sense of it. It has a certain meaning. In this case, the meaning is obviously to put it through um, a specific kind of hole that it would fit through. But we are... We are, it's, it's similar to the Lascaux cave paintings. Um, it is a beginning of the understanding of a concept. Now, I want to 
I want to introduce my son to you. Um, this is, let's see whether this works. This is when he was 17 months old. Mm -hmm. There's no sound. One second. Oops, 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 oops. No worries. Good. Shall we try? We started with the vowels. Yeah, exactly. A little applause for my son, please. Um, uh, many, many of my, my, um, or many of the friends that we've got, they, they think that I pushed him to do that, but no, he's actually enjoying this. When we are sitting on the breakfast table, he's asking for his letters, as he calls them, and um, it's quite interesting to to kind of follow my son through his various steps because a lot of the theories that I I, I kind of developed through my practice, um, I see confirmed. One of which is that it's very easy for our brain to make sense of things. Um, coming back to the, to the shape sorter, in order to, um, in order to make sense of the concept idea, is I, I, few, I would say three months after that, I put four letters next to, next to him and it was B-A-L-L. -L. And he, we were spelling it, and we said sort of B and A and L and L, and he looked at me and said, bye. And he pointed at his ball. So he makes sense, he can build bridges from concepts, from forms that don't mean anything, that are, are a representation of a phoneme, to the actual concept that is there. The shape sort is exactly the same thing. And funnily enough, um, so is Joseph Kosuth's piece of art. It is trying to make sense of things. Most of you will probably notice um, what constitutes a chair. What constitutes a word? I even believe that, I believe it sounds like I'm preaching here, but I'm quite sure that we are not reading the actual letters anymore. I'm quite sure that we read wild or wild or wild in the same way. In our brains, they, these things are being tackled in the same way as they are, whether they are phonetic um, scripts or whether they are ideographic scripts. Um, small, a small excursion into abstraction. Um, we understand forms. We can read a form in its context. We want to. We can only read a form in its context. And it's only then that it becomes important for us. I have my black square here. It's a rather large square. I don't know whether it is being framed by the white. Um, or whether it is, it is dominating the white. I'm quite sure that there is a good equilibrium, an uh, equality of values, and I know that this, this uh, square looks rather isolated. Um, we are looking at information here already. We are, if we only examine the shape, we are looking at data. If we look at the shape here, it's, a, it's a, an, an interesting shape. It's got four corners, but it doesn't, you know, in our brains it already gives us something. It also has meaning. We are trying to make sense of it. It starts to become information. It starts to become knowledge. And eventually, it will start to become wisdom. Um, if I put it in a sequence, we read a sequence. It's fantastic. Nobody says that these, this is a turning square. But we read it. It's actually just four lousy shapes on a, on a, 
on a piece, um, on, a, on a white background, but it is meaning and we search for meaning. We search for meaning in, in how the, the birds fly and what the weather is going to be like, religion. We think money is really important when we don't actually understand what money actually stands for. We are looking for meaning and we are looking for context. Um, a circle here. Simple data. We cannot read it in its con oh well, we don't have a context to make sense of it yet. And suddenly, I have information. I know that this, this circle is um, bigger than the circles that surround it. And suddenly, I have information or I have context that questions the information that I've got. Because um, it's a, an obvious illusion, um, the circle is actually the same size in the middle. Now, we need to question at every point in our lives at, as designers or whether we are as political animals, whether um, what we see is actually right, what we perceive is right. As designers, we need to negotiate these phenomena of perception. We need to, when we create things, as some of you guys might be graphic designers, so I'm probably at this very moment mainly talking to you guys. But, um, you might have come across the occasional client that says, make the logotype bigger. It's an obvious thing. Um, make the name bigger, etc. And it's not just that name that you are making bigger. You're destroying a complete harmonious image. You created a harmony on the page that is solid. In that specific way, it is solid. But if you create a bigger logotype, the whole thing might fall apart. So when, when somebody says, yeah, well, this is you know, just a little bigger and it should be all right, um, it is not. It questions the entirety of the, of the um, composition. Now, coming from, from our, our sort of ways of perceiving things, of perceiving um, ink on paper, um, nobody actually said that this is a Dalmatian, that this is an actual dog. But we are capable of putting things together and make it into a dog. Now, if we are that sophisticated, and this is only, only black and white, um, it's amazing what we can do or how we can work with, this, with um, our readers and clients in order to, to push new ideas and push, um, harm, push uh, designs that are uh, very sophisticated and intelligent, let alone they could even be intellectual. Um, I wanted to bring this back on paper because it is something that brings me again back to our almost natural abilities to sort things out or to, to understand our environment, understand um, shapes and forms. Um, these are two, obviously, two uh, very simple, very similar shapes, um, both of which, the one on the left simulating kind of a tree branch, the one on the right um, in a, a Y, the letter Y in Helvetica Neue um, light um, oblique. And both of these, these um, forms are perceived and processed with the same parts in our brain. So if you see a tree branch, it is made up of individual little aspects that our brain puts together as a tree branch. And it's the same, the same um, uh, areas in our brain that identify typographic writing. Um, typographic marks. Um, Herbert Bayer would probably hate me for this. We are extremely sophisticated animals when it comes to reading anything, whether that's um, body language, whether that's typography, whether that is, that is uh, music, whether that is dance. I just, um, this is the title of a, of a small book that I, I wrote a, a couple of years ago. And purely using upper and lowercase letters in the first three versions has a completely different meaning of what is going on between these two words. Um, I referred to Herbert Bayer very briefly because he was obviously against, against um, uppercase letters altogether and we would lose the ability of making sophisticated differentiations within, within um, the yeah, typography, especially the various languages. Um, another basic principles of how we read our, another basic principle of how we read our world for me is rhythm. Rhythm is, and I refer back to the sequence of squares that I showed earlier, rhythm is um, based on proximity, distance. It's made up of interval, intervals. Um, there's visual and audible rhythm, and they're closely related, as I'll, as I'll show you in a second. Um, and it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. It is in, you know, our heartbeats. So this is the blue whale 
Mickey Mouse to have a heartbeat difference of you know 100 um, of 700 uh, uh, beats per minute. We are somewhere in between, um, and this. There, but there is rhythm in, in day and night, there is um, rhythm in the way we walk, etc. And rhythm also, there was a fantastic installation um, by Kolb Himmelblau at the, at the biennial, I, I would say sort of five, six years ago, where you would walk into a bubble and you would hold on to uh, two joysticks. And these two joysticks would um, measure your heartbeat and would project it onto a wall and would create a really strong sound. Now, there were two sets of joysticks. And if people walked in, their heartbeats would almost become, uh, would beat, their hearts would beat simultaneously. So there is, we are obviously um, informed by the rhythms. I'm going to jump into the audible and visual, visual rhythms. Um, I'm going to try to, hopefully without breaking anything, let's have a look whether this works. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be a very, very uh, amateur drummer now, but you'd all, you all would know this kind of rhythm. It's the next one, the next one is a very simple, very simple um, uh, complication of it is next one. Oh, then they have to put this down. Oh, wait a second. I oh, know they will not like this. <laughs> next, next one. And next one. Any dramas around us? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, apart from that, it would constitute a fantastic series of book covers. This rhythm is very, very gripping. It's very, it, it really makes, it kind of makes sense to us. We have expectations. We hear that there's a, there a, a general beat. We, but we make different connections with it because of its complexity. And there's a big difference between making something complex, which is absolutely fine, or making something complicated. Now, um, Talking about visual rhythms, the only thing that I changed here is uh, in this series of, of lines is uh, the distance between the black squares. And immediately we see, let's have a look whether this works. Immediately we see new connections coming up, connections that run suddenly from the, from the uh, bottom to the top rather than only from left to right. Um, as, as visual animals, we really know we can really read these things, and we read these things in three dimensions. So if somebody says that you know we are only two-dimensional design, blah blah blah, and you know there's very often product designers, architects, etc., there is a, a it comes natural to them that they understand that these two-dimensional things. Um, reading is something very much three-dimensional. From where do you approach something? Um, how do you see it? How does it change in space? Um, and coming back again to rhythm and to typographic rhythm. Um, I showed this before in terms of notation, but this is essentially what typographic rhythm is about is, as well. It's, um, the word minimum is usually used to, to uh, space various letters against each other, and uh, it shows quite clearly that there is an underlying rhythm in every typeface that the typeface designer or the typographer has to create and or uh, control. Um, I changed the rhythm here slightly, and you will very swiftly see that uh, there are other things that, or other points of the word that are being picked up by the eye. In the top line, it is the proximity between the, the last stroke of the M, the I, and the first stroke of the N. On the bottom part, we, I have destroyed that rhythm, and, and I'm basically starting to spell the various words. There is an inner logic of things um, that we are designing. There is an inner logic in the, in the rhythm of books, very briefly. Um, as a comparison, I have here a, a rather large dummy that we used for, or a dummy that we made for one of our projects. The weight of the page, the way the book is bound, um, how it will fold, how it holds, etc., how it handles, 
is something completely different from a small book. A small book, the way it is bound, the way it flicks over, the weight of the page, etc. There is a rhythm in these books. There's an inner logic. It comes from the actual object rather than from us designing anything on it, onto it. There's an inner logic that was explained by, by the Renaissance um, uh, typographers in terms of how a, back then a, a very nice um, or or uh, yeah, it was an, it was considered a beautiful great because of its symmetry. And I don't I don't need a, I don't need InDesign to do this. I can read this from the very format itself. These days, the grids are usually slightly more complex. I brought here a grid that we designed um, for a book which had to work as, as much as it had to uh, contain all the various typographic hierarchies. It had to work upright and sideways. And it's only one, it's a more typical typographic grid. There's another grid that we've, we're currently working on, which is, um, this is a, a work in progress, so it's only a blind copy, etc. But it plays on the idea of floor plans. And instead of following regular typographic grids, regular logic, so to speak, we oriented ourselves on the logic of floor plans and we made a very symmetric grid. And yet it still works for this very specific project. Um, and if you're looking, if you're listening to what you're working with and if you're looking for, for uh, these very specific aspects of the content, you will discover your own, you know, what is important to you. Um, and I think I try to make sense of, of my surrounding by using my, the language of typography. I want to briefly show now four or five examples of students of mine or former students of mine that have discovered their own language. In this case, Olivia Sautreux, um, a printmaker, she's experimenting using the language of silkscreen printing. Um, Miriam Darmstädter, she's using the language of dance and the notation of dance in order to make sense of her environment. Um, Tom Foley, uh, typeface designer, started with Nib, is now working for Dalton Mark on He's the, the head of typeface design for, was on the projects at uh, the most recent IBM typeface and, and Nokia typefaces. And eventually, I want the last student I'm going to show um, is Masahiro Carino, whose work still gives me goosebumps, funnily enough. Um, I can feel music when I look at this. He essentially brought together the language of music and the language of typography using the common denominator of mathematics. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, Moonshine Sonnet. And according to the principles of, the ma of maths, he interpreted um, this piece of music. Funnily enough, this wasn't done on ink. This was actually exposed um, in his bedroom uh, with uh, photographic onto photographic paper. You